Well, we thank God for the word of the Lord today, and here we are at Big Bear Four Square Church. And isn't it miraculous about the internet now? Do you realize that I'm preaching in Pakistan, India, wow. Kenya, Tanzania, wow. South Africa, Asia? Isn't that wonderful? And everywhere else. Amen. And everywhere else, yes. Those are the countries I know for sure that are tuning in today. And we thank God for that. We thank God for his word. So let's pray. Father God, I pray for your word today to ignite a fire in our heart. I pray, Lord, that something in this word would spark a rhema in your hearers. Lord, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to receive today. God, give me the ability to give your word today in power, strength, and anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, <coughs> we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. And we've been preaching through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, Timothy, and after that we'll be into Titus, and we'll see where the Lord directs us from there. The title of the message is Soldiers, Athletes, and Farmers. Paul gives an illustration in this passage from these three. And before I start reading the text, I want to say that all three have things in common. All three had uniforms of sorts, for sure for the military, the soldiers, for sure for the athletes. But I can tell you, after preaching and pastoring in the farming community, you could tell farmers by how they worked, they looked, and they dressed, and how they approached their day. So they had that in common. Each one of these also soldiers has a specific mission, athletes have a specific mission, and farmers definitely have a specific mission. They all have goals that are specific to them. They all have uh, authority and the things that govern what they do than what they do best. So we're going to look into that today. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace of God that God gives you in Christ Jesus. We need to take strength from God's grace. God's grace is not a license, but God's grace is, is, is a covering for when we need a covering. How many of you need this much God, of God's grace? Yes. Well, know this, that he's got this much for you. What does God have for you? He's got a, a little bit more than you need. What if I need a lot? He's got a little bit more than that. God's omnibenevolent. What does omnibenevolent mean? He's all loving, all compassionate, all merciful, all grace, all these things. And he's especially that for his children. So we take strength through the grace of God. I need God's grace. How many need God's grace this morning? Yes. Amen. You know, the difference between merit and grace and mercy, mercy, you deserve something, that, but you're not going to have to pay for it. And grace, you didn't deserve anything, but you gave you it anyway. And God, that's God for us. And so Paul's telling Timothy, pastor of the Ephesian church here, my son, be strong through the grace of that we find in Christ Jesus. Be strong in his grace. You can't do this by yourself. You can't do this alone. 
And the harder you try, the worse things can be. You find that to be true? I told you about the sign, and I'll update the sign, but the mechanic had a sign in his office that says, labor is $125, $150 an hour, let's say. And then it says, if you watch, labor is $250 an hour. If you help, it's $350 an hour. So what's God want us to do? Do our best to get out of the way and let him work in our lives. Amen? Amen. Does God need your help? No, he needs your cooperation. Does God need your help? No, he needs your agreement. Does God need your help? No, he needs you to trust him. Amen. Let's do the things that God wants us to do in the process of doing them. Put your name there. Victor, Mark, Mike, Janie, Russell, my dear children, be strong in the grace that God has given us. Paul goes on to say in verse 2 that you've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. One of the strengths of the New Testament canon is that it was written by an apostle or apostles or somebody approved by the apostles. And the strength of the New Testament is that it's based upon first-hand witnesses, first-generation first witnesses. Paul came later, but he also was in the company of the apostles. And he made it clear that what he pre preached and taught was confirmed by the fundamental first-hand witnesses. Think of the people that the apostle Paul talked to. And he says, I'm writing these things based upon those principles that I've learned from reliable witnesses. So now he's talking about the next generation. We need to see God intervene in our next generation. I, I, I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times uh, it's hard to understand the generation that's coming up. Find that true? How do you think that way? What, what goes through your mind in thinking along those lines and processes and all that? Well, God wants us to not fully understand, necessarily understand or fully approve or fully these things, but God wants us to find a, a plane that we can minister to them and bring them and bring them to the Lord. Amen. I think one of the things that God wants us to pray for is revival in our country. You ready for revival? When God does revival, the altars are filled. When God does revival, the churches are packed, not for anything but seeking God and seeking his presence, praying and repenting and hearing from God. When God moves, I want to be in the boat. Okay, so now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. We're all working on our discipleship in the Lord, right? Are you a disciple? Amen. Amen. The Bible says if you're born-again Christian and serving the Lord, you know Jesus, 
you're a disciple of his. But I think the disciples who really come into our own when we find that ourselves, we can be reproduced in someone else. If we're able to teach what we know, then we know that we really have what we understand about our faith. So many Christians, you say, what do you believe about Jesus? I don't know. Jesus, uh, what's your favorite verse? John 3.16. Uh, what do you believe about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? God loves me. You know, we have to go deeper than that and give an answer for the things that we believe and why. And not only that, we could pass them on to others who will understand the depth of our relationship and the depth of, uh, of the Word of God for themselves. Verse 3 might not be a very encouraging verse for you, but something that you need to hear. Endure suffering. You go through some type of suffering. We believe in God for our healing. We believe in God to touch our lives when we go through things. And I find that the older we get, the more things we are able to go through, right? By God's grace. Endure means to bear under. Persevere means to push through. Patience means to uh, suffer for a long time. But he says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I, I never served in the military, but I sure admire all of you that have. Lynn served in the Navy and Pastor Tom served in the Army. Any, anyone else? And I served in the Air Force. I served in the Air Force. Army. The Air Force, great. Thank you for all your service and, and that, but from di if I say something that might be wrong, Say, oh, me, help Pastor Wright. But if I say something right, say amen. amen. But the first, from the first time you get out on that bus, it's suffering. Is that right? Getting off the bus, suffering. Getting to the boot camp, having that drill sergeant in your face, it starts right off, doesn't it? My dad was a... Staff Sergeant in the Marines, I said, Dad, why why weren't you a drill sergeant? He says, I wasn't mean enough. And so uh, he says, I couldn't give him a bad enough time. I said, well, what's the po what was the point of the drill sergeant and all these things? The point of the drill sergeant is to get them off of themselves. And one drill sergeant told my dad, listen, we tra trained them to have them know that we own them now. We so my dad sat down and to get his hair cut, and the barber said to him, uh, how do you like it? And he, and he says, oh, just on the sides a little bit, and part down the middle, and this side, and this side. And, and uh, eight seconds later, Barbara says, how do you like it? <laughs> Next. <laughs> so everybody's looking the same, dressed in the same, hearing the same messages. Another drill sergeant said, we try to knock the children out of them so that they become soldiers. Am I okay so far? So, Paul Paul says, Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. For then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. 
So my understanding is that after the uh, coming off the bus and <laughs> getting the treatment, they are told that they can make one phone call. Is that right? Yes, yes, and no. Okay, so two yeses and a no, one phone call to say, I'm okay, I haven't died yet, I'll talk to you later, bye. <laughs> and then they're on their way. But they're no more part of civilian life in the, in the case of being a soldier, in the affairs of being a soldier. Why? For they cannot please the, please the officer and listen to them if they are not part of the military structure. I think when we talk and think about this, that we need to be good soldiers of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? We're in the army of God. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18. We are clothed with the armor of God. We have the Holy Spirit as our paraclete in the back. We have the armor of God facing the enemy. But we have one commander, and that's the Lord of heaven's armies. Amen. Amen. No desertion. Our lives do not belong to us. They belong to him. We fight at his direction. We don't fight at his direction. Whatever he tells us to do, we do as a good soldier of the Lord. Remember when Joshua saw the commander of the Lord's army, and he did not recognize him at first. But he, he said, Joshua said, whose side are you on? He said, I'm on neither side. I'm the commander of the Lord's army, meaning I'm here to take control. And Joshua went to bow down. He says, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. Just like that of Exodus chapter 3 for Moses, right? Take off your sandals. So we're part of the Lord's armies. We are the Lord's. Paul's Paul will tell us in this passage to think about these three illustrations that we're going to have today. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. I'm a baseball fan. I, I love, you know, I love the summer sport. Well, this last week there was a young bat hit hitter on the Pittsburgh Pirates, left-handed rookie, and he took two or three pitches and he got so excited he hit a home run to right field, hit the foul pole and his home run. He got so excited he went to round the bases and he missed first base on his way to second. So they, they called him out, you're out. But he hit a home run. Doesn't matter if you missed first base or any base in the process, you are out. So the, the young man, totally thrilled about his home run, that wasn't because why? He didn't play by the rules. He missed first base by this much on both sides. How do you do that? <laughs> Athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. We live by the word of God, right? If we hit a home run, we got to make sure we're touching all the bases. I've been a Dodger fan since I was eight years old, and I still am. And one of my favorite players on the Dodgers is Mookie Betts. Are you familiar with him? Well, considered along with Mike Trout and others to be the finest player in all of baseball. How's he do it? Well, during the off season, 
He plays basketball so he can keep his strength up and agility. He does exercising. He's in the weight room. He, he trains day and night, for, not for basketball, not for track, not for this, for baseball. And, and uh, showed a tremendous play he did this last week, getting a fly ball out to right field where he plays, turning around, throwing it to home, perfect out at home. And I said, how did you do that? Well, he's been training for that for a lot of years. And somebody says, well, that looked like a basketball move. Yeah, it did, because... That's what he does on the off season. It's good to be a great player, but I don't know if I would want to ever put in the time and the effort that it would take to be that level. It takes a special person, doesn't it? Athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. What happens when uh, there's an Olympic uh, baton team men, four during the Olympic race with the baton relay race, thank you. And one of the men dropped the baton, there's the second to the last. And what happens? Game's over. They're done. Yes, they're done. You drop the baton, you cannot win that particular event. And the hardworking farmer. I had the privilege in the early 80s of pastoring in, a, in, a, in Montevideo, Minnesota, among the farming community. And Farmers really required a lot of faith. They'd come to church week after week. Pastor, pray for us that the ground would thaw out so that we can get in there and remove the rocks and, and uh, plow and get ready for the, the ground. Pray. So we pray that and that would happen. Pray, Pastor, that... Well, now that we've got the seed in the ground, that we can get our first rain for the seasons. And we pray for that, and that happened. Pastor, pray that the corn will get some more rain because we need it at least this high by the 4th of July. Okay, Pastor, pray for us that we have enough rain and enough things going on so that we can have a harvest. Th now, Pastor, th let's give thanks God to God for the bumper crop harvest that we have. But every year, it was a whole year of faith and praying, faith and praying. They, they couldn't do anything on their own, really, except for prepare for what God can do for the crops. Hail come. Destroy some of the crops. Pray, to Pastor, that we can put in a new field this year, whatever, whatever it would be. And we would pray as a church to have prayer meeting year after year. And it says, "On hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor." What and what I've learned from them is that it's a industry of faith, industry of needing prayer, needing to believe God throughout the whole process. One pastor, one former friend of mine says, I, I don't know how people farm without knowing God. I says, why? He says, we, we as a family depend on God for everything that we do, every part of the process. So from the soldier and the athlete and the farmer, 
Verse 7 says, think about what I'm saying, Paul says, think about this. So we can think about all the illustrations, and maybe uh, you can have a, I think there's a lot of illustrations for the soldier, for the athlete, and for the farmer. We can think of everything, all the things that they do that we need to apply to our walk with the Lord, right? The Lord will help you understand all these all these things. It's a walk with the Lord as the commander of the Lord's army. It's a walk as an athlete obeying the rules and participating according to the rules. And also it's a walk of faith, like the farmer preparing the ground and waiting for the harvest. In all my time in being a pastor in farm country, I can honestly say I've never seen God fail any of the farmers, even when things went bad. God turned things around, and they were, gave God the glory. And when we celebrated Thanksgiving back in those days, it was back to the original intention of celebrating the Lord for the sake of the harvest that come in. And you really felt the gravity of that, understanding that, wow, the whole year process led up to this very moment. One fan, in my grandfather's generation, there was a lot of farms on both sides of the family. Usually the farms were 160 acres. And so the South 40, they had four quadrants of 40. By the time I was pastoring in Minnesota in the 80s, a lot of the farmers who were, past, were uh, farming 2,000 acres. And uh, it says, where's your son? Oh, he's uh, plowing the field today. How many acres is he plowing? He's plowing about uh, three or 400 acres today. So the equipment, you know, they get out there within a week, they harvest the whole thing and now 2,000 has turned into 10,000, you know, thousands of acres. But the process is the same. Do what you can, do all you can, and trust God to the very end. Well, Father God, I, I pray that this message would be helpful to each one that's here today hearing my voice. God, that you would stir up illustrations. Maybe there's a lot of things going on in their mind right now about the soldier, or about the athlete, or about the farmer. God, Paul, Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 7, think about these things, and you will give us a revelation and understanding concerning that. Lord, I pray that you would bless each one today. Thank you, Lord, for them being in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that's hearing my voice. God, I ask that you would bless them and encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen.